Hey, welcome to the third episode of Marx and Chill, where we read Marx and we chill. In today's episode, we discuss the rent of land. Once again, if you're lost, I'm going to put a link right here to the first episode of this series. So right off the bat, in Marx's opinion, landlords are thieves. They love to get reward without working and demand money for the products of the earth. It is commonly thought that the rent of land is no more than a reasonable profit or the interest for the money the landlord spent on improving the land. However, the landlord demands rent even when he doesn't improve the land. Sometimes it is actually the tenant that does the improvement to the land. And then, when the lease is renewed, the landlord wants even more money. According to Adam Smith, the amount of rent the landlord charges is in proportion to what the farmer can make by the land and by the water there is around him. Rent of land is considered to be the price paid for the use of the land, based on the fertility of the land, meaning they're already taking into consideration all the possible profits of leasing that land. However, it isn't at all proportion because the landlord takes enough not just for him to improve the land, but as much as the farmer can afford to give, and all along it costs the landlord no labor nor care to make any profit. The rent of land varies based on its fertility and whatever it produces, but also on the degree to which money properly applied to the land and how it's developed. When the money and the development on the land is well applied, then the rent is proportionate to the fertility of the land. Now these assumptions by Smith are important because given equal costs of production and funds, then the rent of land is going to be more or less than what the land can produce, which again gives the landlord the credit for what is actually an attribute of the earth, nothing to do with him or her. Now let's talk about rent as it actually happens. Rent of land is the struggle between tenant and landlord. Let's look at the relationship between landlord and tenant. When the landlord calculates the price of the rent, he plans to leave the tenant with just enough to pay for the seeds, the labor, maintaining of the animals, and other household goods that he needs. Basically, the smallest amount possible without making the tenant feel like he's a loser. But all the other profits, the landlord will take. According to Say, the landlords operate a monopoly against the tenant. The demand for land can be infinite, but their land is finite. So the landlord, of course, has the advantage. His position also gives him a larger fortune, credit, and good standing in society. They also profit from the favorable circumstances of the earth, as well as any improvements in the area, a canal or a road, for example. Even an increase in population and the prosperity of its district raises the price of the land, while the tenant only derives profit of the land for the duration of the lease. According to Smith, rent is a bit different than wages and profit. While wages and profit regularly whether you have high or low prices, cost of rent is the consequence of high or low prices. Smith also says that not all products will yield rent, but food will always yield rent. Someone is always willing to do something for food, therefore food can command a greater or smaller quantity of labor based on the prices around the neighborhood, for example. Land, however, always produces a greater quantity of food then it's sufficient to pay all the workers, pay back the funds invested on the land, and still produce a profit. So food is the original source of rent, and it derives its value from labor, meaning the cultivation of the land. So once again, it is the worker that gives value to the land, not the landlord. Now let's talk about how the landlord exploits everything that benefits society. Rent of land increases when the population increases. Rent also increases with improvements like railways, roads, and even improvements to the means of communications. Every single improvement of society raises the rent. Furthermore, improvements to the process of cultivation and the rise of price of cattle, for example, also increase the rent. The landlord gets more money even if the work requires no more labor than it did before. And lastly, all the improvements to labor also raise the price of rent. But just because the landlord exploits every benefit which benefits society, it doesn't mean their interest is the same as the society's. We have already discussed that when it comes to private property, the interest of the individual is an inverse relationship to the interest society has in them. And of course, the landlord is obsessed with creating monopolies. Furthermore, let's not even discuss medieval serfdom, slavery in the colonies, and the miserable conditions of day laborers in Great Britain. Let's only talk about the assumptions of capitalism. The landlord's supposed interest in the welfare of society, according to capitalism, is the interest 
in the growth of its population and its manufacture because they increase their wealth. But we have already discussed that the increase of wealth leads to poverty and slavery. Number two, the landlord's interest is harmful to the tenant farmer and thus a great portion of society. Number three, the landlord can demand higher rent, which means that then the tenant farmer has less money to pay its workers. So it's the workers that experience a decrease in wages when rent goes up. Since a decrease in prices of products creates a more expensive rent, then the landlord has a clear interest in lowering wages. And number five, the interests of the landlord are completely opposed to the interests of the farmers, the factory workers, and even the capitalists. Now let's discuss the relationship of large and small landed property, which is very similar to the relationship of big and small capitalists. An increase in the rent of the land will usually decrease the number of workers employed. Big landed property accumulates the interest on the capital that the farmer used to improve the land, while small landed property employs its own money and therefore you're not gaining someone else's profits. Social improvements benefit the big estate, but the small property now needs to have more cash in hand. Now, lastly, let's talk about the competition between big and small landed property. The profits of the cultivated land regulate the rent of most other land in the area. Only the big estate can produce cattle, for example. So they get to set the highest price in the area, the price for the most fertile land. Thus, they force all the other small land, which cannot raise any cattle, they have to be cheaper by comparison. We discussed that if the fertility of the land and the exploitation of the land are efficient, then the profit is proportional to the size of the capital. But this also means that the owner with the most fertile land will make the most money, which again tends to be the bigger estate. The most fertile land also regulates the price of all other land in the surrounding area. However, they can also do it by underselling one another, forcing their neighbors to have to lower their prices to compete with them, even though many of them cannot even afford it. Lastly, the relationship between land and interest is one that also benefits the big capitalist. Rent must fall, so less and less are able to live off the rent. If the advantage of buying land is too great, then most people will want to buy land and the price is going to go up. So it's beneficial that only the wealthiest people can live off rent, which creates more competition between landlords who do not lease their land, further accumulating land in the hands of the wealthy. Now, some of that land is going to go into the hands of capitalists when they buy it, making them now landlords as well. And some of the landlords will try to employ their land to gain profit and they will become industrialists at the same time. So the worst and final consequence of this competition between small and big land properties is that slowly you can no longer distinguish the different classes in society. Eventually you end up with just the class of the capitalist and the working class, the proletariat. So basically the selling of land creates a money aristocracy. Now Marx asks us not to confuse the shamefulness of selling land with the inevitable but rational consequence of selling private property on that land. He states that the power of land comes from feudal times. The land was essential but not the serf. The lord belonged to the land. The land inherits the firstborn, not the other way around. But during feudal times at least the lord appeared to be some kind of king of the state. There seemed to be an intimate connection between the owner of the land more than just material wealth. Every estate had its own rules, its ranks, its customs. Back then the saying was, there is no land without its master. The rule of landed property didn't appear to be a consequence of money. It seemed to be like a fatherland, like some kind of, some kind of like really small nationality. Those that worked on the land were a part of the state and they were bound by respect, allegiance, duty. The relationship between owners and serfs also have more of an intimate side. The feudal lord doesn't try to extract all that he can from the land. He leaves that worry to the serfs and the tenants. It almost seems romantic. He mentions it's necessary that we abolish this appearance, this romanticism, because it's actually, even back then, a relationship between the exploiter and the exploited. Land, much like man, sinks to the status of commercial value. It is all rooted in self-interest. The working class is being ruled by the movement of capital. The proverb, there is no land without its lord, was replaced by money knows no master. Finally, let's discuss the division of landed property. Division of landed property generalizes the monopoly of owning land, meaning it makes the idea popular that everybody should own land, and thus falls victim to the same laws of private property. The division of labor separates the work, but not in an efficient way. You end up with many different people doing the exact same work, but just in different places. Much like the competition in industry, this competition of division of land 
results in the accumulation of land. So eventually it becomes another monopoly state. We must abolish landed property altogether, abolish the general idea of monopoly, return to the intimate connection between human and earth, and through free labor and free enjoyment it becomes a true personal property of human. Large landed property in England drives the overwhelming majority of the population into the arms of industry and it reduces its workers to utter wretchedness. However, competition among big landed property across different nations also begins. Thus, the price of land begins to fluctuate and accumulate in the hands of the wealthy around the entire world. This foreign competition, of course, means that rent stops being an independent income. A large number of landowners are now forced to displace their tenant farmers as they sink into the proletariat. The farmer tenants, meanwhile, will just find another proprietor to work for. These proprietors who have been accumulated land, they usually don't have the knowledge to conduct large-scale agriculture nor the capital necessary to exploit the land sufficiently. And of course, a portion of them will eventually go bankrupt as well. All the while, wages are reduced to a minimum due to the competition that was going on between the landlords, all of which necessarily leads to a revolution. What I found most interesting about this writing is that it even separates landowners from other capitalists. Usually I tend to think of landowners being like capitalists, but of course Marx explains how their interests aren't even aligned. A landowner wants to exploit even the capitalist class. And I thought that was really interesting, something I never heard before. Let me know what you thought about today's video. I try to change the way in which I took notes to try to make this more easy for me to explain and easier for you to learn on the other end of the screen. But anyways, Thank you for watching if you still are. Subscribe if you like to continue on talking about world domination. Next week's episode is going to be on a strange labor. I'm so excited. That's the reason I like Marx and why I wanted to read all of his books to begin with. So I'm really excited to share that with you. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section of this video. I will see you next time.